Well, thank you everybody for uh, joining us for this uh, mega panel. Um, uh, the world we're operating in today is vastly more complex and challenging than the one we started the, the year in. Um, the internet has arguably become the most important utility that can be provided today. It's something that we can't store like water or food or energy. And as we at Minim have been talking to all the operators and people that we work with uh, around the globe, we've seen the, the, the impact firsthand as we try to address an unprecedented demand for access and network usage. So we wanted to bring all of you guys here today to talk about some of those impacts and ultimately um, share them with the broader community uh, in the hope that it can spark some conversation uh, to, that will enable our communities to stay safer, to stay online, um, and remove the chance of this virus to spread further. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for joining us. Um, we're going to go around the table uh, and, and get some introductions initially. Um, so I'd love you to just spend a, a, a minute or two briefly uh, describing hey, who you are, who your company is, what they do, and some of the you know, initial impacts you've seen as a result of COVID-19. So Gary, why don't we jump to you first? Absolutely, I'm Gary Ford, um, president of Double Radius. So we're a wireless and Wi-Fi distributor with offices in Charlotte, North Carolina, Salt Lake, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, and just outside Toronto, Canada. Um, we, the virus has been um, impactful to us, but not overly negatively impactful. We, because we only have a number, about 10% of our workforce that's in our warehouse, we were able to go remote pretty early in the process. So, and, and um, it's up to this point, we've been uh, virus free within our group. So overall, we, we just learned to be a video family and try to remain our culture there, but, um, and try to, uh, be ready for the, the uptick of business we've seen, but generally, um, all the all things considered, it's been relatively smooth compared to many, many people that have seen it out there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, JJ, how about you? Um, my name is JJ McGrath. I own TechWave. We're an ISP, a WISP out of um, Sherman, Texas, which is just north of Dallas. Um, you know, the biggest thing I'm, and I'm sure it's the other operators in the group will say, I mean, we've seen an easily an increase of capacity or usage up to 20, 30% easily. You know, uh, the network generally runs about 1.2 gig a second for our network. And we're generally hovering around two o'clock, uh, two gig, you know, by nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. So it's just, it's starting to get ridiculous. So our, while during the day is not a big deal because we have excess capacity, uh, most of us generally do during business hours. We have definitely seen a lot. And at prime time, we've been an hour starting to see it encroach. Uh, you know, we're hitting backhaul capacities of multiple. So we're crashing in five new backhauls here in the next week or two. Uh, I need to do another six or seven. And so it's really constraining us in that way. I mean, we're blowing and going. Uh, we've not stopped installs. We've not stopped in service calls. But what we're doing is telling our guys, hey, if you feel unsafe, if someone's sick at the house, I leave it up to you. I've provided um, booties, uh, gloves, uh, face masks, Lysol sprays, uh, wipes. You know, I said, hey, you know, wipe your stuff down, wipe before and after. Uh, once a week, we do a deep clean on all the vehicles. So we do do um, what we feel are safe measures. And, uh, you know, we're a small staff, so there's just six or seven of us. So, you know, no one's been sick. Everyone, if you are, feel like you're sick, we, we send you home at least for two days with pay. Um, but, you know, we just, it's almost business as usual for us other than a few minor things. Great. Thank you. Um, Nick and Patty from WilderNet. Let's have you. Well, um, do you want me to start, Patty? You crack on, mate. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, we've noticed that um, there's probably about double the throughput that we're seeing now um, since January. Um, not sure whether things are massively different over here in the way the UK and the US are dealing with things, but what we've got is we've got a scheme over here where basically um, companies can furlough their staff when they close the businesses. And if you furlough the staff, what happens is the government pays 80% of your salary up to two and a half thousand pounds per month. So rather than businesses ending up closing down, a lot of people are actually laid off and aren't working. 
So whereas um, you guys are saying that you're seeing a lot of people working from home, we're also seeing a lot of people doing Netflix and God knows what else, um, I dread to think, um, using the internet. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really, I, I said we're being clobbered. I mean, it's, it's the network just being used what the network's being used for. Um, we've had a few um, suspected cases amongst our staff. However, testing over here isn't really the same as testing over there. You tend to get tested um, in the US as, as, you know, sort of like you, you think you've got something over here. You only really get tested if you go to hospital. So what they're Matt saying Hancock here just is... Said, Matt Hancock has just said half an hour ago that all key workers can get tested now. Right. Um, so, uh, Matt Hancock is our health secretary. He's um, the minister for health. Um, so he's declared that everybody can get all key workers can get health check um, um, uh, swab tests. Um, Amanda, my wife, is actually responsible for setting the mobile test centres up in Plymouth. So I'll be in a queue, but I don't know about anybody else because um, we're still only doing twenty thousand tests a day. Um, we were promised a hundred thousand by the end of this month. So unless he does some kind of exponential growth, um, it's not realistic. Um, I would note that on my return from London yesterday, I was stopped by the police and asked where I was going and why I was traveling and whether it was urgent and what have you. It was very polite, you know, um, you know, uh, sorry for stopping you, yeah, what you're doing. I noticed you've got a load of um, plants in the back of you because um, I'm bringing my daughter back from university. I noticed you've got a lot of plants in the back of your car and just wondered what you were up to um, and explained to him. He said, oh, yeah, no worries, I'm on your way kind of thing. So um, I think that some places are taking the lockdown more seriously than others. Um, in Leicester, where I was yesterday, they don't care. It was absolutely business as usual. The traffic was absolutely normal. The um, people on the streets were absolutely normal. I saw one person with a face mask. Um, the guy outside my daughter's flat was just fixing his car and people walking past and talking to him as normal. So um, I'm not sure everybody's getting the message about you know social distancing and all those things. I mean, the street on here, I'm looking out onto my um, pavement and, uh, you know, I'm looking out and going, hey, you've been for two walks today, you know, so we're taking it more seriously here in Plymouth, but um, uh, not, so, not so much in other parts of the country. So it'll be interesting to see how we go on. It's good to hear. Thank you. I, ironically, I grew up with Matt Hancock. Uh, he, he's from the same village I am. So, oh, right. yeah, we went to school together for a good while. Um, but I'm not running health in the UK, so I don't feel <laughs> anywhere near on the hooky is. <laughs> um, so, Casey, how about you? Um, we, um, let's see, my kids' cool, my kids' school got shut down, um, and I think we stayed in the office for another week uh, until like the following Friday, and uh, I was just one-on-one -on -one, everybody in the office you know the girls in the front office and everybody in doing tech support stuff in, in in the office i was just approaching them all individually saying you know you're free to make your own decision if you want to go home and work from home take pack up your laptop take your monitors take everything and your phone and you know we'll make it work so pretty much within two days everybody had dispersed in that way and and uh we're pretty fortunate to be in a pretty small town and uh, um, so we don't have a, a large number of cases nearby. I do have a couple of friends who have contracted it. Um, one of them was in pretty bad shape. I wouldn't say they're real good friends, but you know, they're acquaintances. They know who we are. They're actually customers. Um, he was on a ventilator for I think six days continuously and in and out of comas because it's a medically induced coma and kind of scary stuff. He's only four years older than I am, but he has a pretty bad case of asthma. And one of our main office girls, Amber, she has asthma. So once we realized these pre-existing conditions were going to be a huge concern, we, we really, we really, you know, committed to sending everybody home and, and stick into that. Um, the installers, we've got three guys, three installers who, uh, you know, at the same period of time, we decided to uh, discontinue anything in the home. If we were able to do service calls, we would do them, but we weren't going to go inside the house. If we, if 
we went to the house, it was only exterior work only. So we canceled, postponed all of our installs, all of our inside service calls and just, you know, basically said, we're sorry, we're, we're just not sure what's going on right now. We don't want to put ourselves or you at risk. You know, these installers are going to six different houses every day. It just creates a big, a big risk for carrying something from one house and you know, five more in one day. So people were really re uh, respectful of that. Uh, I didn't see any, well, I take that back. There was a couple of people who said they don't care. They, it's not, it's not, they, they wanted the internet bad enough that they were willing to risk it. So, um, we've not stopped see. any installations. Has anybody else stopped installations? Well, we did for a period. We're back to working now. Um, we've just done exactly what JJ mentioned and, you know, outfitted everybody with clubs and booties and, and, you know, everything that they need to be able to do the work fully inside the installs and, and those things. But we've also given our installers the discretion, uh, to not go in the house. If somebody's hacking away and, and acting sick or acting weird, then we're not going to risk it. <laughs> That makes sense. So I think that's a, that's something we're going to come back to shortly and talk a little bit more about installation and service calls. Um, okay. I'm going to quickly jump to your colleague, Sean. Um, Sean, can you just give a little bit more background on Airlink as well and where you operate and how many subscribers you cover? Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we operate in North central Missouri. Um, we're a fixed wireless and most recently fiber internet company with VoIP, um, uh, managed routers, um, we handle a lot of things dealing with that. And we have about uh, 2,000 to 2,100 subscribers currently. Um, hopefully that number will grow once fiber gets going, um, ramping up. Um, we're really excited. We got um, a fiber project in one of our counties that we're building out. Um, as far as the, yeah, the access to the home has been our, our main struggle um, during this time. And we've been trying to ramp up our, our bandwidth capacities to those towers that we knew we needed them. So when we were not doing the installs, we were focusing on, on up in those um, backhauls, getting them where they needed to be and, and um, able to have the increased capacity needed to, to provide for the customers that were going to be staying home and using it more often. Great. Thank you. And Micah, how about for you at, at over at um, what's happening there? Yeah, so, so I'm Micah with uh, Isotech and Casey Coyote, Network Administrator. Um, service the North Kansas City area. Uh, we have some other uh, branches out in Carroll County as well, where we service a little bit closer over near those Airlink guys, actually. Um, and so we, uh, our biggest things that we've seen have been uh, getting equipment in supply. That's definitely been something. Um, we, we were a little bit late. Uh, to the game of managed Wi-Fi in the home. Um, and then we jumped on it. We loved it. We were pushing it really hard. And then sure enough, uh, what we chose to do started slowing down on supply for, for some of those options that we went in that route. So we've definitely seen some equipment um, shortages that are starting to impact us when it comes to installs and equipment needs. Um, we are not letting that stop us from doing installs. It's kind of created some need for alternatives, uh, which, we're, which we're exploring and using. Um, but mitigating it, you know, slowly as it goes, learning, you know, where our supply can come from and, and see if we have some different options. Um, Minimum's definitely helped with that. Um, and then really the second big thing that we've seen is definitely just the bandwidth demand. Um, we have, uh, I, we actually just uh, looked up some numbers today to make sure we were looking at it about right. Um, our bandwidth demand is, has increased on average for uh, a 30 day period from uh, really before all this started, we've had about an 11% average growth in bandwidth utilization. Um, and we have, when we broke it down to like the time of the day, our peak hours are somewhere between 20 to 30% increase, but our non-peak hours so that eight to five a.m. which for us at least based on our demographics was not peak it was our lower time of the day we've seen anywhere from 60 to 80 percent increase just during that window of time um, and that's probably similar to what I guess most 
so the rural areas especially people who have a good uh workforce that's that's been pushed home and and all the schooling and the children that have come home so those are kind of the biggest things as far as business uh we have an increase in inquiries um and that's that's come from the need that's been pushed to home um so we we are not seeing a shortage of of business by any means um we're definitely addressing things i think in a very similar fashion as airlink mentioned that we're we're you know our techs are um being properly equipped uh given the ability to make decisions um based on their own safety um we went pretty hard on keeping our technicians out of homes to start with and we've relaxed from that quite a bit um uh and it, it seemed you know since it's an ever-evolving uh game i don't know if uh casey i'm not sh sure what the deadline for for your guys' uh, stay-at-home order is, but we actually had ours extended to the 15th of May, but uh, they actually just shortened that to the 3rd of May out where we are. I, I assume that's probably similar for you guys. But so we're, we're our, our government officials are starting to shorten that time frame. So we're starting to be able to uh, relax a lot of things and that's helping us, especially with the increase of inquiries and stuff. Like Excellent. That. Thank you. And Lane, you know, you, last but not least in this one, I, I think as an organization that you know sits on the end of a of the first line support for a lot of other operators, uh, tell us a little about about what you're seeing, what you do, and what you're seeing right now. Uh, sure, yeah, Lane, uh, Lane with Server Plus, and uh, if I look a little tired, it's because I am. Um, <laughs> we uh, we typically see a uh, thousand to twelve hundred phone calls a day, and uh, for the last uh, month or so. We've been between 2,000 and 3,000 phone calls a day, so we've we've more than doubled our normal call volume, um, and uh, that that came at a time where you know we were operating uh, three call centers um, where people were coming in, obviously in close contact. So we uh, we moved everybody to work from home. Uh, quite a bit of expense in that because a lot of people only had a laptop and they needed a PC. Uh, with dual monitors to be able to work and and headsets at, at home and all those things and so we fronted the money to uh to get everybody to a work from home environment um got everybody uh, working from home we've we've uh we've hired uh we had a workforce of of about 70 agents um and we've we've hired an additional 60 um in the last month uh 60 agents and and let me tell you if hiring 60 people and being able to train them remotely and trying to get them on the phones in a, in less than a month has been a, a real challenge. We're I'm I'm glad we're doing this call now as opposed to uh, two weeks ago because I wouldn't have had time. Um, we've we've now got uh, we got our hold times back where they're supposed to be. We've got our our capacity where it needs to be. Uh, everybody's working from home, um, and it's been uh, it's been a challenge. I I uh, my wife said to me the other day, "Are, are you ever going to come home?" because I've been working 14, 14, 15 hours a day, seven days a week for the last month. Um, and I, I'm the only one at the office. Everybody else is, is working remotely and working from home. So it's been a, it's been a challenging time, but uh, a challenge that we've kind of enjoyed the opportunity to, to take on to, to try to be helpful. A lot of people who uh, we supported maybe only after hours have uh, sent their staff home. And so we've, we've taken their, their calls 24 hours a day. Um, and then, like like has been mentioned, there's the increased need. We get a lot of phone calls now where people are saying, "Hey, my you know my speeds are slow," and and they're actually getting the speed that they've paid for. But they're now, you know, mom and dad are both trying to download files from work, and kids are trying to do remote remote school, and somebody else is streaming, and all of a sudden, you know, what they thought was sufficient bandwidth isn't anymore. So I had a lot of that. The other thing we've run into a lot of is people um, complaining about a slow speed when it's actually their their work VPN that's creating the problem, and it's not the their internet provider as well so some interesting times but uh but it's been uh it's been a challenge and a challenge we've been kind of we, did, we don't we don't like having to have take it on because of the consequences to everybody but it's been a challenge that's that i've been really proud of my team to step up and do well that's a great segue because the you know but work from home creates a whole set of new challenges right you just spoke about buying equipment for people and making sure people are well set up at home to be successful at what they're doing um i have three young kids at home homeschooling and two of us working which 
is a wild combination. Uh, a friend of mine told me that he left out his front door every day and climbed back in through his home office window so his kids thought he went to work. Um, and they, uh, they didn't bother him all day long. So people have a lot of different ways of uh, responding to this and being able to do what they need to do. Um, how many people, I think you've all kind of alluded to the fact that you've gone mostly remote, but has everybody Happy. sent can their I, staff home? I, can I just ask a quick question of Lane? You said you were getting two to 3,000 calls a week now. Um, how many subscribers are you actually covering? A day. How many subscribers yeah. are you actually covering? Uh, about a half a million. Half a million. So, do they, do they, stupid question, do they tend to be the same people? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't. We're, we're seeing a significant number of inquiries for new service as well. Um, people yeah. who, you know, they were home before and they just used their, their phone. And now all of a sudden they need actual internet service at home. Right, so this, this isn't just the number of support calls that you're getting for faults and issues and what have you. This right, is also significant right. number of sales calls as well. Yeah, no, that's fine, thank you. There's a lot of smiles from that question because we've all had that, <laughs> that recurrent issue, should we call it, coming up and you, know, you can never quite crack that egg. Um, I, it's kind of my, uh, I joke about it a little bit, but, but there are a lot of ISPs that don't need network monitoring because you've got that person. And they are your network monitor, and they're the ones that call 10 seconds after something happens. So, Oh, yeah. Well, so I'm looking around here, and I, I'm pretty sure Gary's in the office, and Sean and Casey look like they're in the office. So how many of you guys have actually sent most of your staff home at this point? Yeah, so all, you... our, all our staff are working from home. We, um, we did that fairly early on. Um, it, was, it, was, it was fairly obvious that the um, lockdown was coming around that week of the 23rd of March. Um, so we just arranged for all staff to go and work from home. We checked that they had sufficient internet to be able to do it. I mean, I'm here in my workshop and, and um, this is my desktop computer from work. So, so from the office that I've, uh, that I've brought back and I you know, made sure that, I, th I don't know about the rest of you guys but working from home, it started off on the, on the sofa um, and then there's a point where you go, no, I've actually got to, get a proper chair you know so stolen the office chair as well and and have to sit comfortably for the day rather than watching telly while you're quite you know while you're um working as well so you've had to make that mental change as well oh absolutely and how so i mean for anyone to jump in here but you know the the working from home i, I said it i have three kids at home and they're very young they need a lot of help with their schoolwork. that is clearly having an impact on all of our businesses for those staff who are needing to work remotely how are you starting to deal with that what what flexibility are you adding you know i'd love, love to hear from anybody here you know uh, from our perspective we started about a week early doing the video calls because our culture is real uh, social in our business so actually, uh, beginning the middle of March, even in our regular meetings, I made people join via video from their desk. And then when they went home, we all agreed that we had a no bullying policy. And while that's kind of fun, the pr perspective was we kind of welcomed if your pet came in or if your kid came and bothered you or you were wearing a hat. And there's been stories about people getting up and they're wearing their bathing suit or whatever. And I think from that perspective, we, we have been lucky in that that really worked for us. And even we've been able to do sales trainings much more effective this way. People are more engaged. Yeah, we've done training on PPE as well. So, you know, we've, we've well, there you go. Sure. <laughs> and, we, and we did provide masks for all our employees to use socially. And, and it's, it's made a big difference just being able to have everybody comfortable and get our eyes on people as much as possible. Yeah, we had that policy fairly other kit meetings, making sure that the directors keep in touch with all of the staff and make at least a call a week to everybody visually as well. Yeah. Well, how are you guys feeling about morale as well within within your employee base? Do you, you know, is that generally good? Like what, what are people struggling with? Like what's the general feeling there? Uh, from our perspective, um, and our people have been uh, have been really they've been great about it. They've been, they've, uh, they've enjoyed being able to do it. A lot of them, you know, we have, we require a quiet work environment. We require they have a private room that they can work in. Uh, we require that, that, uh, they have certain internet speeds and certain computer uh, capabilities. Um, 
but uh, from those those perspective, it's been pretty good. The the interesting thing is that uh, we offered a perk uh, to our employees that I never thought I would offer, which was uh, we we own an office building, and the office building is completely vacant now because everyone, not just our employees, but everyone else is working from home. And so uh, one of the uh, one of the perks was that you could come pick up as much toilet paper as you wanted because we had it <laughs> in the office building. So. Uh, <laughs> There was there was plenty of toilet paper and uh, lots of hand sanitizer. So our, our perk was free toilet paper and hand sanitizer. Which, if you My told people right three time. months ago, if you told people three months ago that was going to be your perk, they they'd have laughed at you. And now, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's interesting because uh, so at Minim, we I mean we went remote in March and we've we've stayed remote, um, but. You know, as I think about, you know, one of the things we've always talked about is how a lot of you guys are on the end of now managing people's Wi-Fi, right? You're not just an internet provider, you're a Wi-Fi provider. Um, but what I'm, I'm really interested to know, like, are you now the IT person for the home? So, you know, we, we said earlier, oh, they call up and they have an issue with their VPN speed for their office or whatever. Are you, are you seeing a lot more of those types of inquiries and having to handle them and help them through their connecting back to the office issues as well? It, we are yes, and and it's been we're we're fortunate about uh, about a year ago we we changed kind of how we do our support and we have a we have a triage team that does the the initial broadband support and then we have a LAN team and there the LAN team is specifically um, focused on local area network and once we've determined the internet connection is up we have a group of people who are trained specifically to do LAN calls. Um, they they help with the routers. Um, if you've got, if, for those that have managed router solutions, they've got access to that. For those that don't, we've got access to a lot of information about router support. Um, but we, those guys are the ones who spend a lot of time helping those. And, and we used to see maybe 10% of our calls would go on to that LAN team and 90% were solved by the broadband team. And now we're seeing closer to 20% going to that LAN team because we're seeing, um, we're seeing a lot more people who have those, those local area net network issues that, that uh, you know, maybe in the past didn't matter as much to them, but right now it's critical. Mike, you are nodding in there as a network administrator there. Are you seeing a lot of that type of inquiry all of a sudden? Yeah, so we, you know, we've actually run, I, I talked to with our customer support representative and we've got, we've got a lot of customers calling in having having speed issues. Um, but we actually found that about 50% of them, about half and half, is the uh, the training that the customer needed to adapt their connection to what they needed. So, you know, we bring a lot of people that work from home now, um, and then you bring all the kids that are now doing their school from home. Um, the school districts in our uh, demographic area definitely took advantage of uh, remote schooling, um, and a lot of that is video a lot of that is content driven and so you get you know the the dad that needs to work from home he's doing video calls but then you get this kid that's um you know doing school from home and another one that's doing netflix in the background and so we ran into about 50 percent of our our issues with connectivity were actually driven by maxing out the consumer's packages versus it being an actual issue and so um, to try and jump ahead of that, we ended up taking a stance where there were obvious people that needed increases. And so we got those people in increases, but there were other people that just needed educated on, Hey, you're, you're going to probably want to not have your kids doing Netflix while you're working from home. Um, and so we've, we've got a mix. We've definitely got some that are that are actual bandwidth issues that we've been addressing and going on and we fix those issues, but we've actually seen a really high amount of people that have just run into just, they are consuming their bandwidth, either they need it in a speed increase or they need to just reallocate how they're using the bandwidth. And really the, especially with the managed Wi-Fi solutions, those have been really easy phone calls, you know, before managed Wi-Fi, that, that could have been a 30 minute, 45 minute phone call tracing down where that band was coming from, figuring out why their speeds are being maxed out. With managed Wi-Fi, it's a it's a five, 10 minute phone call. Well, your 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 kid's Roku, your your three year old's Roku is using all your bandwidth or something like that. You know, so uh, managed Wi-Fi has definitely assisted in that perspective. But yeah, we're we're definitely seeing the impact. 
uh, we've adapted. We, we didn't really go over training our customers very much on how to use their bandwidth efficiently, but we've definitely had to focus on that um, and help our customers understand um, that there's, there's ways that they can uh, modify things and prioritizing things can help in some ways. But when you just have 30 people now getting on, on the internet that weren't using it before, it's definitely something that educating people has helped. Excellent. And I, so, I mean, I, I think most of you guys have talked about capacity issues and throughput issues. Uh, you know, the, the WildNet guys, uh, you know, deploy typically via LTE and we hear a lot of challenges right now in terms of, you know, capacity on towers and those networks being overloaded. Are you guys, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're already, you know, slamming in a lot of new connectivity, but, um, are you thinking we're at the peak now or are you planning for further capacity um, in case this continues? Yeah, we're putting in a, um, uh, one of our main backhaul links is a five gig link. Um, and we're now putting an 80 gig link in to back it up as soon as possible. It was something that we planned as the upgrade path anyway, um, but um, this sort of accelerated that rather than... Um, you know, leave it to natural customer growth was what. We're that's expecting. a that's a large step up as well. I mean, JJ was talking about very similar stuff. I mean, huge capacity upgrades as a yeah. as a result of this. Um, well, if, if I'm going to spend six grand, I'm going to get a nice toy. So yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of interested. I mean, you're you're watching your traffic. You know, the the we're talking about in a day, but you know, a lot more business traffic, but also entertainment traffic as well. But do you guys have a real view of you know, where the majority of it is? Is it an even split between those, uh, you know, the, the consumption's increasing equally between them? Or is it actually the, you know, hey, there's a lot more entertainment happening as you alluded to in the UK or, you know, uh, actually. I, I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at mine at the moment at one of our main backhaul links. Um, and it's, it, as the normal, you know, more in drop off about midnight and then eight o'clock, then it comes up and it's peaking at midday and dropping off into the evening. So that's what we're finding. Um, so that's obviously work and entertainment traffic turning to only entertainment traffic in the evening. Yeah, makes sense. Do you, uh, do you think that the moves from people like YouTube and Netflix in terms of reducing quality, um, I mean, they, do you think they, they helped? Yeah, considerably, yeah. yeah. Fantastic, what else could they do to be helpful at this point? Do you think there's more that they could step uh, up and do? No Microsoft updates, no game updates. That'd be nice. Um, Animal Crossing could pack it in for a little bit. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of interesting. The, the Windows update is one we hear about pretty regularly. What about peer-to-peer -peer traffic? Is that still is that still a challenge? Has there been an increase in that? We haven't seen a particular one apart from my house. Um, <laughs> 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 we'll edit that out afterwards, Patty. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> so, um, for those of you who are putting people into into homes, I mean, obviously you've got field tech teams who have to come and get equipment, and then potentially go into people's homes and do installations and service visits and so on. Um, clearly, they're they're still happening. You talked a little bit about the safeguards, but how are you? You know, what are you doing in your your warehouses or office locations to you know ensure that everything is is safe for the employees? How are you protecting them from that perspective? So I mean I I guess I'll start. We we went pretty uh, pretty strong to start with. We run two man teams for our technicians, um, and when we actually started initiating some of the safety protocols, we actually split a two man team up into two separate vehicles and actually let them run in uh, two separate vehicles so that uh, even just that close contact that would normally happen during the day wasn't happening in the vans. Um, we've laxed up on that. We put them back into uh, uh, the same vehicle as they rolled during the day. Um, and given that as uh, something that the technicians actually have the ability to say, hey, if I don't feel safe doing this, so we, we've really allowed the technicians to make all of their own safety decisions if they feel uncomfortable, but have provided them with, with the PPE, the protective equipment that they need um, if they so choose to, to continue working. Um, as far as like in the office and stuff, we really only have technicians in the morning in the office and then at the end of the day, they drop off the vehicles. Uh, initially, 
we were actually allowing them to take the vehicles home with them and deploy straight from home, stock up for more than normal so that they could uh, avoid the office. Again, we, we laxed up on that after things kind of cooled down a little bit after that initial um, fright and that initial wave. Um, and so now we are dispatching out of the office like normal, but using precautions, having cleaning done, um, you know, doing the six foot policy. Uh, we actually had um, a lady in our office make masks for all the technicians, some reusable masks they can wash and stuff like that for just that, uh, not N95, not the crazy filters, maybe for the customers, but something that everyone has the ability to use um, and that we encourage the use of when there's close quarters and whatnot. Um, and that's, nice. I mean, that's really how we've done things around the office is keep things clean, keep things organized. So is that homemade Casey? Is that the homemade masks? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And hey. so we've gone and found some, basically some good, uh, ideas on how to use that, um, and ways that they can be re-sanitized, make sure that they're obviously built so they can be clean and reused. Excellent. Are you doing that as well, Casey? You're de demonstrating yeah. your mask there. Yeah. One of our customers, uh, decided to start making them. And uh, I just called her up and said, hey, I want eight. And uh, they're a little bit, the elastic is so tight on them, it pulls my ears forward. <laughs> Painful. <laughs> JJ, what about for, for you guys? How are you uh, protecting those guys as they come in and get equipment? And... Yeah, I mean, like we I already said, I mean, we do, um, we, I just ordered masks. Uh, one of my, my local polo guy t-shirt, embroidery place he actually can get masks so i actually have my little logo being put on them right now i mean they're cloth masks they're not to me, my opinion and my, i have my wife and my sister-in-laws uh, i mean they're all nurses i mean the cloth masks are basically a joke but it's false insecurity the uh, we had customers say hey i don't want you coming in unless you have a mask on okay fine here's our mask i mean it is what it is so yeah. Yeah, but so we provide masks, we do, we Lysol wipes, Lysol spray, bleach spray, you know, we ask to wipe everything down before and after, we put booties on, we got gloves, so, you know, the guys, if they don't feel safe, they're welcome to turn the job down, they're not going to get any backlash from me, um, I'm not going to complain to them, um, so I just tell them, hey, just business as usual, just use your head, if someone's sick there, just deny the job, move on, say, hey, when you're not sick anymore, just give us a call, we'll gladly come back. Um, but you know, we all, the one major thing that we did change on this is that we install on outside walls only. So we try to just go on the outside, um, and just go in and out of the, the house really fast. And whereas before we would do an inside wall drop and made it, you know, put it where the customer wants it. So that's the, probably about the only chief major difference that we've done on our installs. So great. Thank you. Hey Gary, you. You guys have 10% of your workforce in warehouses. Like, what, what's that meant for you? Um, I think much like everybody else, we just practiced good habits, both um, between teams and with their hands and with the antibacterial. Um, really, we had one person that came down with some symptoms just of a cold, and we had them go home for a number of days. Past that, we've been fortunate, but... It, um, generally, it's just good practices, and it sounds like that's what the other guys have done, too. Yep. Anyone else doing anything exceptional on the front to help? We made sure that our um, two, two main installation teams can't meet each other. So we've put one in the west of Cornwall and one in the east of Cornwall, and uh, they they don't mix at any time. So we, we did that very early on. Um, that was partially selfish, because if... if one team got ill, then I still had another one. That was um, that was kind of the logic behind it. Um, so um, we also ended up with myself and Nick working out on the ground to to m maintain the network element while the installer guys just did installations. So that we've sense. actually increased our remote support. So we used to be pretty proactive and actually would send techs out to a job simply because it was a lot easier and the customer was much more receptive to resolving certain issues on site. Um, but we've pulled back a lot on that. If, even if it takes a little bit longer on the phone, a little, a little bit more effort from our support technicians, um, if we can resolve it, if it's an issue that we 
would normally resolve on site but could resolve remotely um we're we're doing that and we think it's really hard to tell you know it's not a lot of time but we think we've cut down on on support calls by about 33 percent just by increasing the the effort that we put into our remote support just keeping people out of homes as much as possible i'll have a long-term saving for you won't it oh yeah so Actually, this yeah, is I interesting. One, we... one, one of the other things that's interesting between the UK and the US is that um, a lot of our pensioners and people that are classed as high risk um, are actually isolating themselves. They've been told to isolate. So what's happening is, is they're actually the driver between um, not interacting with people. So whereas in, in a lot of the cases that you guys are describing where you're saying your teams are making the call, what actually tends to be to happen, what tends to be happening for us is that the customer is actually saying, you know, don't come anywhere near us. So um, it's actually sort of like almost the reverse for us than it is for you. I don't think we've actually had any installed teams actually say no so far, but we've had lots and lots of customers that have said, you know, can we step back, you know, a little bit on the work that needs doing until we're sort of like free again, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So the way that it's being touted over here is that um, it, you going out, isn't the risk isn't that you're going to get it the risk is that you're going to pass it on so that's the way that they're pushing it over here it's okay saying you know hey i you know i'm in the age group i'm healthy i'm okay my chances of surviving this are really really good i'm going to go out and rub myself up against a lot of pensioners or old people but, you know i don't know if you refer to them as pensioners there but you know so it's it's really kind of the reverse way we are than it, than it is for you whereas you know the, the pensioners and the at-risk people are locking their doors against the outside world Makes sense. Great, thank you. I one thing I'm really interested in is, I mean, so so a few of you have, you know, smaller, more intimate businesses, seven, eight people, and you know, you probably had very good communications before this, but um, you know, some of you run bigger businesses as well and have a lot more people to communicate with and stay in touch with. How have your communication tools changed? What are you, you know, what how were you communicating before, which I presume was mostly, you know, a lot in the office. Um, what is what has changed? How are you replacing that face-to-face -face contact? What tools are you using? Um, we have about sixty employees um, in our locations, so we've gone to a variety of creative, um, like a daily newsletter, and it's just one little short page that says, "Hey, here's what's happening. Here's our what's uh, happened from a sales perspective, from an operations perspective. Here are our birthdays for the week and." Um, it's been fun. Um, we, you know, some of it's creative and some of it's um, pointing out kind of the how to deal with some of these challenges, both from a um, getting out in the, of the house and actually going for a walk, and, um, and from the perspective of how your family's driving you crazy and you would like to go do something else. So, uh, our perspective, we went overboard to try to over communicate because our culture is so social. It's been very effective. It's been tiring from a management point of view, but it's been very effective. Um, we as, uh, we usually see, um, our, I would say four to five times a week, we have our eyes on someone and it's been, you could argue that's too much, but it, from our, my perspective, it just, it, was really necessary for us to be able to manage. And our much like y'all's businesses, our business has taken off since this has all happened. So we're doing, you know, 30% more volume with the same amount of employees. We're not adding staff right now. So you're asking a lot of these people to over communicate in a real fun way and to keep their eyes on it has been really my task. I like the newsletter idea, especially the birthday bit, because mine's on Monday. So I think we'll start a newsletter tomorrow. So. Yeah, I agree. I think I'll just send you some uh, e-gift cards. You'll like that, right, Patty? <laughs> That's the way, yeah. <laughs> oh, you mentioned I'm on the last two calls, Patty, so I'm guessing it's pretty Good. important. We should, we should pay attention. <laughs> it's, just, it's his 29th. <laughs> it is, again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're in a low-risk group. I was listening to Patty talk about he and Nick being involved in the network. I suspect you two like that. You know, you probably haven't been able to get in the nuts and bolts of the, the network. Actually, we hadn't time. worked together for 30 years. So it's been, yeah. Um, we've, we've known each other for 35 years, which 
actually puts paid to his 29th birthday. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> and yours as well. <laughs> oh, that, that ship sailed a long time ago. Oh, so, uh, Sean and Casey, how, how uh, has communication changed for Airlink? Well, uh, we, <clears throat> we have a daily Zoom call. We, we're a lot smaller group. Uh, the in-office group, you know, the CSRs and, uh, and Sean and, and Daniel, who's another key employee um, in the CSR group, uh, we all get together on a Zoom call twice a day, actually. Um, and uh, that seems to have kept everybody together. It allows us to kind of joke around about certain things and um, band together. I've missed more than I've been a part of, but I know everybody else that's um, been a part of them, it seems to be a very positive thing. And uh, that's one of the, that's, that's the, that's the key thing that we've done. Just communication, make it, trying to make it feel as if we're still in the office, but uh, even though we're not. Yeah. Just to elaborate a little bit too, you know, we, we had great camaraderie before and uh, we also use uh, Slack to, to communicate back and forth. But, um, our early morning meeting, we just go over, you know, what maybe happened after, you know, overnight or what kind of tickets we're looking at, you know, just trying to get a bearing on, on what we're dealing with after all the calls have kind of subsided in the early part of the morning. So around 10 o'clock we'll meet. And then in the afternoon at two o'clock, we'll get back together and see what still needs addressed, what may have um, come up um, since the early morning meeting. And just to, to finalize the day, you know, make sure that everything's getting taken care of um, for the day. Um, we do have um, Daniel, who um, his background is in call center and, and VoIP related um, businesses. He had a, a letter that he had sent everybody um, kind of explaining what to expect working from home. Um, you know, you make sure you, you keep a schedule, keep everything um, rigid like it was before so you don't feel like um, anything get is dressed much right yep get ready for the day get <laughs> get dressed in your clothes Please like you're dressed. going for work um, and have a, a private area where you can work where it's away from um, the rest of the house where you know you got boundaries if you have people that are at home with you whether it's kids or um, other family members to know that you know once you're in there um, you're working um, so kind of keep that um, being bothered to a, a minimum and make sure, you know, you can, you get up and, and take a lunch. Um, don't just eat at your desk. Take that 30 minutes or an hour to, to get away and, and not have that, that time where you're still wrapped up in work and stuff like that. So that's been pretty helpful. Um, we've also, to kind of backtrack a little bit, we did send a, a responsible internet user guide out to all of our customers to kind of um, head that off in the very beginning um, where we're anticipating the increase in capacity. We really haven't seen it a whole lot. Um, people have been pretty receptive to it. Um, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, if, if you're going to be downloading games, let us know. We may allow you to increase that or unlimit your bandwidth in the middle of the night where you can do that, where it's not um, overloading our system. And people have been, Pretty respectful of that and we haven't really seen the, the uptick like we, th we thought we might and there have been people asking for that ability you know they'll say hey my kids got this game it's 90 gigs can we get a faster speed for a little while and in some cases I know or we know that no we can't do that not at that tower site it's hammered or um, LTE we're we're pretty well bottlenecked on our LTE systems and but in some cases you know we'll bump them up in the middle of the day if, if, uh, if, uh, if it looks like we could be able to do that, so. Is that guide something you might be willing to share with the community as well? <clears throat> so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That sounds great. We, actually, yeah, we were, we actually um, got it from uh, one of the Facebook groups. Somebody had, had shared it with them and we, we kind of borrowed it from them and, and tweaked it a little bit to fit our own needs. That's but phenomenal. yeah, absolutely, we can share it. 
I, I think, I mean, very much like we all have a responsibility to stay home if we can. We also have a responsibility to, you know, utilize our resources in a, in a way that, you know, puts less stress on everybody else. So I think that, that would be super useful. And actually, you guys talked about a couple of things. So at Minim, I mean, we, we have a couple of offices, but we, uh, we also have a lot of remote people. So we've been used to operating remotely. But, you know, there is a, there's a significant cultural change that happens as a result of everybody being remote and suddenly having, you know, the, the, the homeschooling and all those issues. Um, we've been running, you know, happy hours, coffee mornings. We'll get people together for just social hours. Just come hang out. Talk about what's going on in your life. Uh, there's no obligation to it, but we want to hear, you know, what what's happening. And then also stepping up our one-on-one -on -one time with, you know, everybody in the company, making sure they're getting good face time, that we're helping them out. I think asking those questions, hey, what can we do for you? Do you have everything you need? What else could you use from us right now? Um, and being very receptive and flexible. I know I, I get a lot of flexibility because, you know, the, there's times when I need to spend you know, sit down with my kids and, you know, the eldest is eight and the youngest is four and they need a lot of help with their schoolwork. Um, they can't be self-taught and self-driven right now. Um, you know, and, you know, you pay that back. I think people tend to want to pay that back when they've, when they've been looked after like that. So, um, Lane, I'm really interested in, you know, you've gone from a, you know, big call center environment, you've expanded the company. I know you operate internationally as well. What has that meant in terms of communications for your employees? Well, we use, uh, we've used Riot, which is basically Slack that doesn't cost a, a, a lot of money. <laughs> so, so we use Riot. Um, but we, uh, we've used Riot for a long time. We had three offices here in Utah. Um, we've actually, and, and then we had an office in the Philippines. We've actually shut down permanently uh, the office in the Philippines and the other two offices in Utah. All of those agents have gone to work remote. Um, and we're not going to go back. Um, we've made the decision that that's a, that's a permanent change. The, the employee incentives, um, that, that incentive to be able to work from home is, is a big deal. Uh, they really appreciate it. And uh, it's actually increased our hiring pool. That uh, increased uh, hiring has really helped us. Um, but we, we use Slack and we have a lot of, a lot of groups in there. Um, and those those groups, the be able, the ability for them to be able to chat within the groups. We have a we have a, a group for the managers. We have a group for ideas and suggestions. We have a group for um, uh, for just open discussion. We have a group for a whole bunch of other things. Um, and uh, and so all of those uh, all of those things have been helpful. We we have an outage room um, because we we deal with about fifteen to twenty different outages a day from different uh, internet providers. So we just see all of those different, uh, those rooms, but, but I'd like to see some of those right. comments in that. In the outage room. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. So we, uh, but, but we use that for announcing, Hey, there's an outage, here's something going on. So people are, are aware of it. We might have hey, to redact some of those. <laughs> hey, hey, Lane, I'd be interested to know, you know, in our world, we've been able to be flexible, uh, with, you know, if you need to do what Andy said, step away for a little bit for your kid or, or you can go for a walk, your, your world's not as flexible because it's based on call volume and, um, and your commitments to the customers. How do you, how do you handle that with those uh, in-home employees? How are, what were some kind of ways you dealt with that? Uh, one of the things we've done is we've given them a lot of opportunity to, uh, to pick their schedule. So we, we create a schedule, leave it open, and then let them pick and choose um, what, what they want to do and the times that they want to work. That makes sense. So that, that's, made, that's been helpful. We've had some who only want to work evenings. Okay. I, I had a lot of anecdotal from feedback from across all sorts of different industries with people going remote is how surprised companies have been, particularly large companies, at how much productivity they're seeing as a result of everybody going remote. And, you know, a lot of that social time in the office gets cut down. And yes, some of it's replaced with other obligations. But the reality is, I think you lose a commute, you lose the long lunches and those types of things. The, the you know, the, there's a lot of industries seeing benefits um, to this. And I, you know, from my perspective, I think we're going to see substantial changes um, 
you know, as a result, you know, we're also going to see new new challenges. We go from managing mm -hmm. Wi-Fi and devices and IoT in the home to now, how do we support these corporate entities who have all these remote employees that they want secure access uh, back in? Um, you guys got any thoughts around how how that's ultimately going to change our industry? Well, let me let me jump into one thing. One one big challenge that we've done, and we're fortunate to have some really good IT guys. But uh, with the number of people that we have connecting, we've had to put up multiple VPN servers. So in the past, we ran one VPN server. We now have five. Um, and those VPN servers are critical. And, and we, we did it. We don't necessarily need five, but we did it so we had failover capacity and could roll from one to another. Um, but that's been one thing that's been a big deal because most of our clients, um, in order to access their, their information, it's all got to be accessed through our network. Um, but then... <laughs> Then we have to also remind people that when you're done working, turn off the VPN and quit watching Netflix through our VPN server. So that's <laughs> been the other challenge. Um, so that's, we, we, uh, we actually, what we've done is we've limited their VPN. Um, our guys have figured out a way to only l allow them access to the VPN during the hours they're scheduled to work. And if they want access at any other time, they have to request it from, from the floor supervisor. Lane, any when you say floor su supervisor, you're really needing a supervisor working from home. I am yes. Okay. We still we still are, are stuck with that vernacular, but yes, you're you're correct. Okay. They are that, was, that would make sense. Let me uh, let me switch the conversation up ever, ever so slightly because you're chatting, Gary. But um, hardware supply, we we seen particularly you know there's a lot of Microtech users here where where we support a Microtech platform a lot at Minim. Um, the supply has has dried up, but demand is going through the roof. What are you what are you seeing in the middle of that? You know, and, uh, most suppliers try to do a little anticipation of needing additional resources over the, probably from March to June, and we burned through that product by the end of March. So um, the positive part of it is China has come back pretty quickly and is starting to, we're, we'll probably only have a two to three week lag in that. Our bigger concern is what you said, where like Microtech and others who have a, some presence in Europe, Europe has really s just stopped in, in many cases. So a lot of our manufacturers who are working, it, or at least con consolidating some product in Europe is re are really gonna have a big shortage. So we're, we're okay right now, but I suspect it will, um, I think it was Micah who said this. I'm not uh, sure. I think everybody's having to be creative with their networks. And you're saying, I can't get this product. And it's not a distributor just not buying correctly. None of us can get it. And someone's having to say, well, can you use this or can you use that? And I, I think that from that perspective, it's made the WISP and service provider industry more creative. But I do think we will continue to have some shortages as we go into the summer. Um, and I would, you know, us, we're a revenue built organization. We'd love to have that product, but we just don't see um, really a good outlook over the next couple months for just a, a, too much product will be, we'll, I think even now when we get a shipment in, we're filling back orders and then waiting for the next shipment. And I, and I don't think it, it's really changed from that perspective and that you're having to be creative, both for your customers and in the service provider business. Yeah, I think to piggyback off of what he said, yeah, I think, um, you know, as, as a provider, the last thing we want to tell a customer is we can't install you because we can't get equipment. You know, we, we, we made some calls that said we're not going to install you because of, you know, the pandemic that's going on. But it doesn't, it's not really a great thing. You just, it, it irks you to have to say, well, I can't install you. I can't make money right now. And I, I can't provide a service because I can't get a piece of equipment. So I think, especially our company, that's, that's like the last thing that we want to do, you know, and we have equipment, not only for new customers, but we have equipment that we need to supply for maintenances. Um, so we're, we're ordering more at a time. We're trying to stock up because we don't know when, the sources that aren't dry yet are going to dry up. Um, and I think everyone's probably feeling that we probably have some suppliers that are, that are already at that point, And then we have some that aren't, and we're, <laughs> we're trying to take advantage of the, of the people that haven't run dry yet. And so 
we definitely, from our perspective, the last thing we want to tell customers that but we can't do something because we can't get equipment. Um, and luckily to this point, we have not had to say that yet. So we're quite lucky. We, um, lucky. Um, we had Brexit coming. So we had a panic buy to put stock on our shelves because we didn't know what would happen to our borders. Um, so back in March last year, I actually drove over with a big Spr Mercedes Sprinter van and filled it up with stock from the Czech Republic. Um, um, Microtik and Ubiquity kit and we kept that stock level at pretty much the same. We're sat on um, a little bit of light beam still. Um, we're starting to run low on Microtik kit especially you know haps and hexes and things like that but we, we have some but um, prisms I've still got boxes of those and um, light beams I'm not short on kind of thing so. You want a hat? Thousand bucks a pop gives a show. <laughs> Sadly, as you probably can sell them, <laughs> there's a good chance of that. I think um, you know we free we've mask seen, with everyone. We we've definitely seen service providers, you know, I think scrabbling for for Microtech, um, looking at alternatives. Uh, you know, hey, you know, there there are a lot of alternatives that Minim operates on, um, which which is great, but. You know, we're seeing supply chains dry up everywhere right now. So, I mean, how long can you guys all keep installing before you actually run out of, of equipment? Do you carry a month or two of inventory typically, or are you, are you much more just in time? From the Brexit, we've been keeping a month in stock. Um, on the 4G kit, we have 35 left. That's, and that's us. That's probably three weeks. Month to three weeks. Alink, are you, are you still good? Yeah, we, we've been pretty good. Our um, supplier has been keeping us supplied pretty well. Um, we The only thing, it depends on maybe um, certain models of stuff. I know Microtech half ACs, the 962s, we've been short on a little bit, but um, we haven't really seen any other shortages on any other equipment, so we kept pretty well stocked. And I like to keep um, at least, you know, router base probably 20, on hand um, in excess of what we have. And then um, ubiquity stuff, um, usually about a 30 day um, um, advance to, of equipment so that we have it on hand when we need it. Makes sense. JJ, are you seeing similar issues? Are you pretty well stocked up? Yeah, we were working on at least right before this stuff really hit the fan. And uh, so we had just got and several hundred radios, several hundred routers, stuff like that. The one thing that I noticed, noticed that it took almost three weeks to get um, the coordinators to do our FCC links, our licensed links, and I'm still waiting for our licensed radios to come in. So it's like, I gotta grieve. It used to be inside of two weeks before all this, I could have had them coordinated, everything was good, and gone to Dallas and pick them up. Now we're scrounging. It's like, oh, pull from this warehouse, pull from that warehouse. It's like, okay, radios are coming from here, antennas are coming from over here. I'm like, God bless, this is ridiculous. So well, that's, that's my actually, next question. Yeah. Well, I mean, backhaul. I mean, you 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 speak to it. That would be the the same challenges exist in terms of those backhaul radios, and certainly stuff on the license spectrum. You know, delays coming in everywhere. Um, you know that if that's that's preventing you deploying new customers essentially right and keeping the, the networks decongested um what 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 challenges does that bring in for you well for me i mean i mean what this is hurting the biggest thing that, at least when pertaining to backhauls is that my capacities i got two towers that are max capacity every single night so we get a little bit of grumbling it's not too bad right now but it's not and it's not particularly Clearly stopping me from adding more people. We just have to be conscious of who we're adding, what kind of user they are, what kind of speeds they're signing up for. And that's pretty much it. Um, but I know we can't go hog wild on over here on this tower in the Northwest because he's already maxed out. We have to wait till we get his capacity up. But we also gone through and split the traffic through static routing, say, don't go out this back hall, go out this back hall. Because every one of our towers has at least two back halls. Some has three or four back halls. So it's not a big deal to um, um, you know, max it out. And when they do, people call in and complain, lanes people take care of them and just say, hey, you know, it's, it's all good. I'll get the server plus ticket and say, hey, speed complaints and then we'll call them the next day and say, hey, here's what's going on. So it's not a big deal. 
Are your yeah. upstream providers still providing service? Um, we can't get new um, layer two links. That's not available to us at the moment. Um, OpenReach BT um, have closed their order book until June. Um, and so there's no new capacity available for us. That's a, that's a big issue. We're pretty fiber rich. Um, we, you know, uh, starting out, had a lot of large, long 11 gig links that shot 20 miles to get bandwidth into a new area that we wanted to explore or expand into. And um, those links are still up and running, but we've luckily been able to add some layer two fiber connections over to those areas and offload that wireless burden. Um, and actually uh, one, well, two, two of the providers that we use for that off net uh, transport contacted me and directly with phone calls and said, Hey, if you need anything, upgrades, new circuits, anything like that, let us know, you know, providers like us are getting that extra, um, we're at the top of the list, you know, we get moved to the top of the list. So we've seen the opposite of that and it's yeah. been, haven't had any issues really. Yeah. I would say we've gotten the same experience we've had actually never before have we been pitched so many opportunities to increase our, our fiber before, but yeah, it seems like, um, we, we've had a lot of options given to us for, uh, new links, upgrading current links. Um, and really, uh, it, and I don't, I don't know how, how, uh, opportunistic they are on this, but they're, they're doing it with some, some pretty decent, um, financial opportunities as well, given the scenario. And so I think at least when it comes from us as a, you know, a, a consumer provider and our upstream, I think they know the benefit that they're going to get in the long haul. Um, and I think they know it's going to benefit us. So I think it's really helped a lot in our area, at least. Um, I think Casey's probably hitting with a lot of the same, same people. So central, central U S at least is operating in a, in a fashion that, can really favor um, our industry like that. I want to be very respectful of people's time. I know we, we just slightly rolled over. I, I do have a couple more things I want to ask you guys about, but if you have other obligations and hard commitments, please don't feel that you are obligated to stay here. Um, you, can, you can drop off. Um, hugely appreciate all the input so far. Um, Crack on. Crack on, Lane. You okay? <laughs> I, I am. I, I I wanted to. I've got some good information. I kind of wanted to share a little bit about uh, on the financial side of stuff as well. So when I know that was on your agenda, when you're ready to hit that. Yeah, well, I, I that would be a great great time to sort of segue segue towards us. So um, you know, I, I think a lot of that is based around you know, but there's clearly been um, some desire to help people get online to successfully transition to working and teaching from home. Um, you know, certainly here in the US, we've seen the FCC open up new spectrum. We've seen kind of money come in. Um, but Lane, why don't you give us a little bit of background on, on what you're seeing initially? Um, and then we can take it from there. Sure. We, uh, we went after um, right, right early on when the, uh, when the idle, program came out, we went after the, the idle loans that are available, uh, the economic injury disaster loans that are available through the, through the Small Business Administration. Um, they were available, they, they announced them like on a Friday, and I, and I spent about 30 hours that weekend filling out everything necessary. It was a huge amount of paperwork and everything necessary to apply. And then on Tuesday, they came out with the expedited form that took 10 minutes to do. Um, but because I did everything early on, uh, we've actually already been funded by our, uh, our idle loan has been funded. Um, and yesterday I signed the documents for our PPP loan. Um, so that's been done as well. So we're, we're fortunate that we've been able to see both of those, um, the funding for both of those come through. Um, and then the other thing, uh, and I know a lot of people, we, when we applied for the PPP loan, uh, we applied for it through it, uh, for it through our, our traditional lender, our traditional bank. Um, but I, I didn't have a ton of confidence in them. They haven't been the best uh, when it comes to the SBA stuff. They take a long time. And so I went through, uh, I have a friend who owns a company called Lendio. And I went through Lendio um, and applied for my, uh, for my PPP loan through Lendio. 
Um, the bank came back four times, wanted more documentation. And after the, and on the fifth time they came back and said, Oh, they ran out of money. Um, Lindio asked me for information up front. I sent it to him. And four days later I had approval. And, uh, so I, I was able to get that SBA loan because I went through Lindio as opposed to going through the traditional bank, uh, which I thought was, was a big plus. Now there is additional PPP money coming out, but I don't think it will last either. Um, so it, it just, uh, that's one, one thing. The other thing that I thought was interesting, and this has not been talked about a lot, but SBA, uh, if you have an SBA 7A loan, um, SBA has announced, um, somewhat quietly that they will make your payments on your SBA 7A loan for the next six months for you. Um, so those, that, that's another important thing, but you've got to kind of go to your lender and push them a little bit on it. Again, my, my lender, traditional lender, the, uh, the bank that we have, um, they were kind of, uh, they, they didn't say much about it. Um, and I went to them and said, what's the deal with this? And they said, oh, let us look into it. And they're an SBA lender. They should have known, but they didn't know. Um, so I went and pushed them on it. Um, and that's a, it's a big deal for us because the, the loan on our building that we purchased is an, actually an SBA 7A loan. Um, so it's a, it's a $10,000 a month payment on our building. And uh, the SBA is going to cover it for the next six months. So it's, uh, th those are some, just a couple of little bits of financial information of things that we've done um, that, has, that has made a big difference for us. Like I said, we've had to hire, you know, we've had to hire 60, 70 people. Uh, we've had to provide equipment for people to work from home. It's been a very expensive undertaking for us. And so this has been a, a huge benefit for us to be able to, to move forward and, and be able to do that. Because for us, we bill everybody um, per call or most people per call. And so we're, we're, we have to hire everybody, put everybody working from home and work for them for a month before we can start to invoice for it. So it was really going to impact our cash flow. And this has been a, a huge benefit for us. But it, it was not, I and mean, it was a ton of work. Um, but but well worth it. I, I've heard similar stories that the more traditional lenders are really struggling with the, the SBA loans and the stimulus packages in general, but the more progressive uh, newer lenders have been actually very successful in uh, accessing those. So it's good to hear that confirmed and good advice to anybody who's going to apply for that second round of funding that, you know, find a lender who's had success there before. Don't go through, you know, that pain of them not knowing what they're doing and not able to get you through that in time. Has anybody else access to any of the, the stimulus funding at this point? Yeah, we went to, we got the PPP loan. Um, but that's, that's the only thing I've done. And it was, it was similar to Lane. Uh, it was pretty quick. You just submit the application. If it, I mean, if the, if the bank knows what they're doing, just submit the form. It was literally a one page form and um, send them some, payroll documents and away you go. You, you didn't do the same form as Lane, right? Lane? No. <laughs> well, so the PPP form was actually quick and easy. It was the idle loan form that was, and it was, it was unbelievable because it was like submit financials and six months pro forma and this and this, uh, and all this stuff. And then I did it all. And two days later, they come out with this expedited form that takes 10 minutes online. But I think the fact that I did mine early and had it submitted early before all that other stuff came out is what got me uh, funding for it. Because I don't think if I'd waited to fill the paperwork out until it was the quick expedited form online, I don't think I would have seen those funds. Yeah, that was a race, I believe. That was first in, first served. Um, what about in the UK? They, I mean, you talked about furloughing and, you know, 80%, but obviously the, those people yeah. can't work for you if you furlough them and they're getting their, their yeah, salary from the government. It, yeah, furloughing is on a three month, uh, sorry, on a three week slot. Um, thankfully, we've not had to furlough anybody. Um, uh, first thing the government did was um, return uh, local building tax, what we call rates. Um, so everybody got a £10,000 or, or £25,000 um, grant straight in their bank. Um, single form, you just had to you, there was no qualification. You just had to be a, a rate payer. Um, there are various um, grants available and loans available um, coming through. Um, I only hear on the news because we haven't applied for any. Thankfully, um, our lead investor, because uh, we're still in an investment phase, um, just turned around and said, yeah, we've got you back. So we've been very lucky in that regard. Um, and uh, so as, as far as I hear, Getting business loans is fairly easy. 
Um, you, it's a matter of filling it out. Our banking system is not quite the same. I don't think it's as competitive as yours. Um, you know, I've been with the same bank since I was in the army. <laughs> it's just the same bank, you know. 29 you years, Paddy. You've been with yeah, them for 29, 29 years. exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's not, you know, it's not something that we, we, and we don't pay fees and things for our bank, for our banking. You know, it's just, it's just the bank. So um, it's, it's working quite normally. Um, the, um, the EU funding, which is coming to an end in this country, um, funnily enough, I had a call today from, um, uh, from a, 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 the, the Cornwall branch that does, that does the EU funding. And they've had a dry up of people asking for grants. So they're saying our next two employees are now getting 15% of their salary paid for by the EU because um, we're in the last year of, of, of paying for everything over here um, so actually it's going to work as a positive because the, the because other businesses are shutting down EU grants aren't being claimed and so there's a, a little bit of money sloshing around let me ask you let me ask you guys this so um, you know where most of this group is delivering essential service you are not allowed to shut off service for non-payment right now certainly in the US that is a we are obligated to continue providing service. Yeah. Um, have you seen any, you know, any implications of that in your business? Uh, yeah. How are you going to deal with it? I'm on a, a weekly call with the um, uh, Department for, for Me Media, Culture and Sport, DCMS, who's our, uh, the ministry that runs um, Ofcom and on all the regulatory affairs for us. And um, they're kind of pushing that we shouldn't be cutting people off, but they've not made it mandatory. Any of you guys seeing any subscribers not not paying here in in the U.S.? Has that become an issue at all yet? Uh, for us, we've had a couple of people ask uh, when I gave them an option to say no problems. You know, we'll just slow your speeds down, and you can pay this. And when you can, and you don't have if you have a problem paying for this, just we'll just keep you on. Like no no no, I want to stay at my same high twenty five meg plan and terabytes of data usage i'm like no it doesn't work that way <laughs> so uh um i only have out of all our subscribers only one only one or two i have a feeling we'll see more in the next few months depending on you know how long they shut keep everything shut down but uh, yeah, we'll see we've had a few of our internet service providers who have who've reached out to us and asked for extended payment terms um, they wanted to be able to pay take a little bit longer to pay us um, but it, we've kind of taken that on a case by case basis because we've got some who are great customers who've paid us on time for a long time. And, and uh, we know they're going through a short term cash crunch. We have others who, who are habitually late. And so we know this is just an excuse on their part. We've gotten some hateful emails from people saying, if you turn me off, it's on you. Like it's a passive aggressiveness. It's a, wow. isn't that ridiculous? So I mean, I mean, we're all in this together, right? And we want to help everybody out and, you know, yeah. we're clearly going to collaborate. I, I think actually there's a good message that's been going around, which is that you should reach out to people that you owe money to and say, hey, I'm in this position. Yeah. What can we do? And, yeah. you know, JJ sounds like you're responsive to that. Lane sounds like you've been responsive to that. Like, actually, we just need people to engage with us and say, I, hey, I, I got laid off. I'm, I'm in this position, um, you know, and we'll work something out. I think uh, our our customers uh, don't don't read enough into the news. I don't think our customers know uh, that kind of information. So when we get someone calling in, say they can't pay, they're desperate to like set up a payment plan to make sure they don't get set off. So I don't think our customers are aware of that. They're more actually under the impression we can still shut them off or that we will. So I prefer to leave it that way because as far as I know, we haven't had anyone call in say they they can't pay or won't be able to pay. Um, I think at, at worst we've had at least one customer that called in and they, they uh, said, I can't pay all of it, but I can pay as much as I can right now. So I think, I think we've, our, our customer base is uh, very dependent on it. We don't have as many customers that it's a luxury for them. So a lot of our customers are definitely um, doing what they can to, to keep the, to keep the service on. And we haven't had, as far as I know, anyone that's, that's just said they won't, they won't pay. I was hesitant to apply for the PPP loan for that. Well, I was hesitant because I, I knew we would, 
be able to make payroll without any problems because of revenue and you know customer base and so I, I didn't really originally want to apply for that PPP loan until I considered the fact that it's possible customers just like Micah just said will call and say I'm not gonna be able to pay my bill and what can you do and now that I have this I mean technically PPP is not supposed to be used for anything but payroll but you know, this is a loan. It's a one per, a low low interest one percent loan that it's cash that um, I'll be able to use and and with good confidence pay my bills. You know, and uh, forgive some of these customers. I'm hoping none of my customers are going to see this video, but um, you know, forgive some of my customers for the the money that is owed to us. So that's that was my approach for the PPP loan and and uh handling those phone calls that i i pretty pretty confident we're gonna gonna start getting well and equally if you look after those those subscribers who are in need at some point i mean they're going to become very loyal um if, if they're not already then you know they're, they're going to want to repay that down the road um everyone is going through different challenges right now and i think we're we're uniting in different ways to help them through it um so you know i, I think this group has a has a very positive attitude towards that. And, you know, hopefully we, we're going to weather the worst sooner rather than later. Um, who, uh, not relevant to Patty and Nick here, but in, in terms of CAF funding, I know, Alink, you, you actually have some CAF funding which you can deploy. Um, Micah, do you, did you get any, did you do any CAF funding or? I don't believe we've done any of that. Yeah, we, we, uh, we've considered it, I believe, but I don't think we've initiated anything. So, uh, so the CAF is the Connect America Fund. Um, the it's uh, grant money um, for service providers. Um, you know, I think they they allocated about one point two billion in the last round um, to connect up rural regions of the U.S. And Airlink was certainly a winner um, in that. Um, I know they're pushing back a lot of the testing as a result of of COVID, but equally are you finding that you might need to deploy faster because demand is increasing and people need to be online right now? Um, well, we're the fiber guys, uh, the contractors we have hired, they haven't slowed down at all. They're out there every day, um, which it's a, you know, they're not around anybody. They're, they're working in usually crews of two and you know, they're one guy's in the hole and the other guy's sitting on the mini hoe or they're, sitting on a plow and rolling down the road. So pretty, pretty safe. We've not had to limit any of that, uh, at all. The demand though, we have, uh, I don't really have any before and after way of tracking, you know, what it would have been without COVID and what it is now, but we've definitely gotten very, very little, uh, kickback from anybody who doesn't want to, hook up to our fiber you know we're we're in the middle of creating a, a marketing uh, strategy so that we can um, be hooking up customers as we're passing them down the road um, so but everybody that everybody that we've approached saying hey fiber is available to you we want to get you hooked up they're all for it fantastic well thank you good insights um, we roll well over time, um, before we, before we finish up and I deeply appreciate you, uh, you know, um, continuing on here a little bit, but, uh, I'd love to, what is your one, one top recommendation for keeping your community and employees safe through all of this? We've talked about a lot of things, but what's a, what's either one takeaway or one thing you brought into this that you, you think is important and I'll, I'll run around my screen quickly and ask each of you, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll get it wrapped up. So uh, Gary, how about you? Well, I think the thing we probably preach more than anything is it's okay to be kind of corny or a nerd and wear your mask and wash your hands and do all the things that you feel like we need to be healthy instead of worrying about kind of popular opinion, worry about what you need to do for uh, yourself through this process and just give everybody permission to, you know, some are going to be more worried. Some are going to be less worried and just being open for all those kind of idiosyncrasies within all of us. Thank you. Nick. Um, if you don't need to go out, stay in. 
You sound like a politician. No, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it's spread through human contact. You know, if you, if you don't need to go out, then you're not going to bump into people if you don't go out. It, I know it sounds really ridiculously stupid thing to say, but, you know. Um, it's, I mean, it is we, so true, we, though. We, we, we've had this massive conversation right now with 10 people spread across the world, you know, and there's no reason why we can't operate like this. I mean, at WorldNet, we've recently done everything on Teams. We communicate heavily. Uh, we've got two offices which have three or four people in them at a maximum. Um, we talk to people all the time. Um, we've got in the habit of doing it on a video call as well. We don't even tend to just voice call people now. We tend to video call people and what have you. You know, we, we yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, Lane's point about closing offices and stuff like that, you know, I think this is actually a big wake up call that, you know, we don't have to sit on each other's laps to be able to work. You know, we, we can be productive. In some cases, we can be more productive. So, you know, I, th I think, especially during this, I mean, last year you were a couch potato or a lazy git for sitting on your sofa. Now, now you're a social warrior and you're saving the world, you know. I mean, go for it. Great point. I, yep, I, I think that transformation is, is very apparent and very upon us right now. And it would be nice to, co to actually continue to build on that and do a more, you know, environmentally responsible thing and also a socially responsible thing. So thank you. Sean, how about you? Yeah, I just share the sentiment that uh, both Jerry and Nick said about, um, you know, if, if you, you know, do what you need to do, if you feel like you need to um, stay home and uh, if you're in a um, uh, physical state that, that is in high risk, um, definitely stay home if, but if you're not, and um, like this past week, I've started coming to the office again. Um, there's not anybody, we don't have the, the cases that everybody else does. You know, I, I mentioned before we all came on that we probably have uh, 20 in the three counties that I traveled through to get to work um, total cases. So, I mean, it's not really a high risk here, but um, do what you need to do to stay healthy and stay safe. And, um, you know, it's, it's within your rights to, to stay home if you want, and we'll, we'll make do with that. Thank you. Patty. Um, I, I would say don't think this is a short term thing. We're, we're used to disasters that are like floods and fires that happen quickly and then disappear. This is one that's going to last the year. Um, so that's the planning that you should be doing around it. You know, don't think that this is something that's going to be done by the summer, be done by Christmas. This is something that will affect our businesses in the longer term. And that's how your planning should be. And in terms of your staff and how, how you operate with them, trust them. You know, if they're a bit worried about something, you don't know what they saw. Just trust them. Um, they'll be fine. Excellent. Thank you. JJ, how about you? Uh, basically, just be safe and use common sense. You know, uh, if you're sick, don't come into work. You know, just nothing fancy here. Just, you know, be a little bit more mindful of what's going on. Excellent. Thanks. Casey? Yeah, uh, I'm just going to echo what, um, everyone's already said Patty said something too um, just it's this is a this is a world changing thing and it is not gonna happen it's not gonna be back to normal fast and uh, we're not gonna shake hands anymore this is you know no high fives no shaking hands going to McDonald's to sit down at a table that somebody else sat at five minutes ago is gonna be in everyone's mind and you know the world's changing and uh, just be ready for it and just don't be shocked with anything that happens and um, and you know be safe stay home like like everybody said and, um, just live your lives thank you Micah um yeah I mean obviously agreeing with with pretty much everyone else you know take care of yourself um, keep yourself in care um, but also don't don't get too uh, self-minded. Keep others in your mind. You know, if you're uh, if you're concerned about something, I can guarantee you someone else is. And if you're not worried about something, I can still guarantee you someone else is. So just you know, be safe yourself. Keep yourself healthy. Um, but just remember that everyone else needs to stay healthy too. I mean, we're all we're all in this together. I know that's getting kind of a cheesy statement at this point. You know, sounds like a line from High School Musical or something, but. 
um, it, it is true. I mean, everyone has to work together. So, you know, keep yourself safe, but just, you know, think about others, be, be mindful that other people are going to be way more cautious than you are. Some people are going to be way less cautious than you are. Um, but just like we tell everybody else to do what they should do, you know, we should just remember that they're going to do exactly the same thing you're doing. So. Excellent. And Lane. Well, uh, a couple of things I would say, uh, first of all, uh, I, I would welcome the rest of the world, um, newfound germophobia to my long, long existing germophobia. Um, <laughs> so the, those of you who have seen me at the shows know I always have a bottle of hand sanitizer at the show and, and use hand sanitizer between shaking hands. So to me, this was nothing new. This is kind of how I've always lived my life. Um, but, uh, but I will say that, uh, you know, remember that necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and there is, uh, there's a lot of things that we've found as a company that we're changing that we, uh, we never anticipated uh, changes, but now we're finding that some of them are actually going to make us more efficient as a company. They're going to lower costs, particularly in Utah County. We had 1.7% unemployment before all this started. Um, we could not, uh, we couldn't hire people. We were struggling to hire people. And this has allowed us now to go out and seek a, a larger employee base we've hired from all over the United States um, because we're, we've got people working remotely now. So it's been, for us, that's been a, a actually a, a bit, a benefit that we're going to get long-term out of this is, is more, more, uh, a, a bigger hiring base, better talent pool. Um, and, uh, and I think a happier employee base as well. Fantastic. Thank you. So the things I hear here, a plan for the long term. I, I think, you know, we've, we've all been, you know, optimistic and wanting to get back to work and get back to our, our normal lives. And I, I agree with your sentiment, Patty. I think this, this is a long-term change and, you know, we should, we should embrace the positive sides of it and, you know, figure out our way through the tough pieces of it. Um, you know, follow our, follow our human nature there. The other key messages I got here for trust your employees, like, you know, everybody's working in this new environment, actually trusting them, you know, communicating with them continually. Don't, leave people in isolation by already isolated enough, like actually keep that, keep that, you know, line of correspondence open, keep talking to them, keep telling them what's happening in the business, that communication. I, I can't, I, I don't think we can understate that. And I think while Gary's doing with his daily newsletter, it's a lot of work, but it, it clearly helps. It keeps morale up. It, it keeps people engaged and interested in what's happening. And I think allowing people to be vulnerable is so important right now whether that's employees, whether it's our customers, whoever it is, like everybody has different fears and different experiences right now. Bad things are happening to some people and other people are, you know, in, in relative bliss. They, you know, nothing bad is going on around them. Um, everybody has different, you know, scenarios that they're living in. And I think we, we need to be open to that vulnerability. Um, making use of the loans and schemes. We don't know what's going to happen economically, what impact this is ultimately going to have to our livelihoods. And we, we should make use of those stimulus programs that each government is providing so that we can be here for the long term and plan for the long term. Um, and then being responsible. You know, we're being asked to isolate ourselves. Um, clearly, it's a, a lot more challenging for some of us. We have warehouses to run. Uh, we need to go into people's homes and get them online so they can work remotely or get their kids to school. Um, but being responsible around that, and it sounds like everybody here is, you know, working hard to ensure that they are responsible. I talk to other people and, you know, they, they are um, more cautious. They, they will, they pull back and said, hey, we're not doing new installations or we'll only install for key workers. That is absolutely fine. But, you know, it, there, we do have a responsibility there, uh, not just to keep people safe, but also to help this new way that we're all communicating and all working. Um, and then I, you know, I think Lane just touched on something great there, which is, hey, they're hiring. Like, if you can, keep people employed, hire people. Like, the, there's an opportunity here to, to grow our businesses where we are more essential than ever before. So, you know, let's, let's pay that forwards. Let's, you know, find ways to, to keep job growth, to keep the economy moving um, while this transition happens. And I think we'll all come back in a better, stronger place. So, you know, you guys are on the front lines. You're like the warriors who are enabling us, you know, people like me to work remotely every single day and, you know, keep the lights on for other people. So, you know, 
thank you for participating in this. Thank you for all you're doing. And thank you for giving up so much time today to come and have this conversation. I truly appreciate it. And I know as we push this out in the community, there's some absolute gems of information that everybody else will, will enjoy. And hopefully we can improve everything for everybody. So thank you.